Hello, good afternoon. My name is Laverne Antrobus. Um, we're here today because negative body image is something that affects almost everybody at some point in their life, and um, we thought it'd be very helpful to have a conversation about it. So joining me now are four women who are experts in this topic. Uh, Nina Nesbitt is a singer-songwriter. Terry Spent is a professor at New York University. Winnie Harlow is an international supermodel. And Dr. Susie Orbach is the co-founder of the Women's Therapy Center. Thank you. So I suppose, Susie, I wanted to start, really, by thinking about um, you know, where we are with this negative body image that you know, so, so often we're hearing about, and you know, what your sense of the proportion of it is. You know, how worried do we need to be? It's really not a trivial issue. It's very hard in a conference like this where we've been hearing the stories across the world to think, what on earth are we doing talking about co body confidence? But there are links between what's happening here and what's happening all over the world. And I've been working in this area for a very long time, sadly, and the situation really has gotten extremely bad. It's gotten worse and worse. It's penetrated younger, older, and across every continent. And we're now seeing girls of six in the playground, transacting around body dislike, saying they feel fat, going on cosmetic, getting cosmetic surgery apps that they can play with. We're stealing their childhoods. We're seeing that as they go up the age range, that they're, they live on social media, which is both very exciting, but it's also aspects of it really harm them because they don't feel that they're actually themselves, but they're having to present themselves. And they're learning about display as being the way that you engage with the world rather than contribution. Mm -hmm. And recently at, a, at UN Women, I, I spoke about this on behalf of the British government, and there were women from Sudan, from South Sudan, from Indonesia, from India, who were talking about the way that civil society is being robbed by girls' confidence being undermined. And these are girls with tremendous capacities and desire to engage with the world, but this virus of body hatred is entering into their experience of their own capacities. It doesn't mean we don't do great things, it doesn't mean we don't want to look good, but it's perverting the kind of engagement that it's possible to have. It's causing enormous torment and anguish. It's the, it's the conversation that sort of happens at one level, but it's underneath at another level. And it's very serious. It's not just affecting girls now, it's affecting boys. Because if you can get as many boys to hate their bodies as you can get girls to, there's an awful lot of money to be made. So it's a very, very serious public health emergency, which we don't really address as that. I mean, I think what, what I take from that is, you know, it's a very personal thing as well, you know, that every young person is engaging with this on, in their own level. And Winnie, you have a very personal story to tell, and I wonder if you could just share a little bit with us about you know, what vitiligo is, but also how it shaped your sense of growing up in terms of your own sort of relationship with your body. Um, vitiligo is a skin condition where uh, your immune system thinks that uh, your skin or your melanin is a disease, and it fights it off like it would something like the common cold. Um, for me, it started to develop around the age of three years old, and amazing enough, I don't remember, you know, it growing or anything like that. I kind of just remember myself looking like this most of my life, so um, I think that's amazing. I think that also has to do with not having social media or anything like mm -hmm. that Absolutely. growing up and me not having to present myself as much. Um, but as I look back on pictures of me as a child, I'm like, wow, I don't remember looking like that. I don't remember ever, you know, having to feel like um, I had to prove myself or I had to dress myself up. I feel like that more so came when I reached um, schooling age, middle school age, where I felt like, you know, I need to impress some boys or I need to, you know, um, be better than the next female or so on and so forth. So um, that was really hard for me because already at that age, you know, in middle school, you're already thinking like, oh, she has amazing sneakers and, you know, her hair is so long and so on and so forth. And I had this thing that was way more different than just having a different hair texture or a different um, outfit. It was something that I couldn't change or I didn't ask for. Um, so that really, I feel like, haunted me as a child. I, I 
didn't know what to do about it. Um, there was really nothing to do about it rather than, I mean, other than live with it. Mm. And is it something that you took home? I mean, did you take those questions home to your family? Sorry? Did you take those questions home to your family? The ones? Um, not really, but more so because my family never treated me differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was more so at school. So when I went home, it was just Chantel. Yeah. When I went to school, it was the girl with skin condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Terry, I wonder, you know, what your sort of unique take might be on, you know, where you position social media and how it's really having an impact on young girls' lives, women's lives. What is it sort of communicating to us at that level? Well, I come from the question more from a, a, a media lens. And so what I have found interesting talking to girls is that they're not just the object of the camera, they're the producers of their own images. I think that's really important, especially when you think about something that Chantal was saying, you know, she couldn't change, yeah. uh, you know, her physical uh, appearance, and yet an image is something you actually can change. So one of the things that I've been finding is that uh, more and more girls are coming uh, to an awareness that body image when you're talking about social media, is about 22% body and about, you know, 88%, did I get those numbers right, uh, image. And uh, that means lighting, filtering, positioning, choices about sharing, choices about um, uh, having things perhaps not ready for prime time and, and building your networks of trust using images for communication. And that is something that I think sometimes falls out of these discussions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nina, you know, that really fits with what my next question is about, you know, you launching your career on the internet, um, and that's gone very well for you, you've got lots of followers, but I'm sort of wondering, you know, what was the inspiration for the song Selfie? Uh, I know I engaged with that word on a number of different levels, watching my own children, you know, being a little bit obsessed with their selfies <laughs> and, you know, how they take them. And I am, you know, what you said, Terry, about, you know, being in charge is very helpful. But tell us a bit about your inspiration for the song. Um, selfies to me was kind of like a modern day breakup song. And I was on tour at the time with my bassist and we were just talking about how selfies had started becoming this strange phenomenon that everyone was taking part in. Um, and I often like to write about social commentary style kind of stuff and um, I just thought it was becoming more and more apparent that people were using social networks to try and get assurance and like validation for themselves or just posting the great parts of their life and what a great time they were having. Like say they'd gone through a breakup, posting a nice picture of themselves to say, look what you're missing, look what a great time I'm having without you. And it's just this kind of fake reality. It's like only what you want people to see and it's not actually the truth. So I wanted to write a song that kind of just said that coming from the point of view of someone who was posting because I've definitely done that in the past. <laughs> yeah. I think it can be a very sort of protective layer, can't it, to sort mm -hmm. of let people know that life goes on in a way. But Terry, I just want to come back to you about this sort of actual selfie pose in and of mm -hmm. itself, because I suppose what I find fascinating, you know, and I, I find myself in the clinic setting talking to young people about this, you know, mm -hmm. about the, the way in which they want to be seen by the world. Mm -hmm. There's something about the selfie that almost has a form. You know, it, 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 you know I, I think... They look similar, you know, in terms of how you hold the camera, how you position yourself, what you show in the photograph. Have you got a, an idea about that? Uh, again, I think I would say that uh, they look similar uh, when you're seeing the ones that are released for general consumption. They don't look similar when you're asking girls what kinds of photos they take, mm. what kinds of photos they share on something like Snapchat or when they're making goofy faces or when they're emulating the very thing that you think, when they're emulating to, to, uh, play, to tease and to play with these images that people think that they're slavishly imitating. Mm. So I, I think that there, you have to remember there's the photo, there's the, there's the editing, there's the decision 
uh, to upload, and then there's the decision who will see that upload. And all of those can be changed and played with. So uh, I absolutely agree that there's a best self that you want to put forth, but you know, I'm old enough to remember Tears of a Clown by, what was it, Smokey Robinson? So, I mean, the, the idea that you put on a good face during a breakup is, is it's a pretty old idea. Mm -hmm. Susie, just coming back to you, I mean, where are you sort of pitching this sort of change in the conversation? You know, I, I sort of have a sense that we've always been a bit worried about how we look at particular times. That shifts around. But it's so dominant now. You know, wh why is it really in, in this sort of generation's psyche? Well, I was just thinking about the, the selfie and it, both the benign and also the troubling aspects because you put a selfie up, you want 24 likes. That, you, you get 24 likes or 26. Most girls want 126 likes. That's what the research shows. So the search for a kind of recognition and validation and being seen, it's as though we've democratized beauty and we've democratized each of us having to be a brand that we sell. And yes, in my mum's day, she had to look cute or whatever it was for a couple of years to catch that, that elusive thing called a man, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if my mother was still alive and we're in an old age home, she would still be primping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my grandchildren are already getting involved in that. So we've seen a spread that is absolutely devastating and it's an accompaniment to life as though we're on a search for a body that we can feel safe in. So if we look at the selfies, of course they all look the same at first look, because one of the ways that we belong in society, and maybe we're just very adolescent about this now, is that we have to look like everybody else in order to then differentiate and be ourselves. And that is a struggle that somehow is going on much longer and is predicated on the individual rather than any kind of collective action. And I think what's very, been very important about women in the world is that we've seen instances of gorgeous collective action mm -hmm. and of standing up, and, and the thing that, I suppose disturbs me so much about this robbing of children's lives is that they have to participate with this burden of feeling, I don't look okay, I need to, I need to find a way to look okay in order to do the things, in order to participate. And why has it happened? I'm afraid there's a lot of money to be made. Yeah. Winnie, I suppose, you know, that, that sort of touches a little bit with your story in that, you know, I'm sort of curious about when you decided that actually, yes, modeling's for me, I'm going to punch my way through that and sort of manage, you know, the squirrely bits, the knockbacks along the way. I mean, what, what's, what sort of got you through that? To be completely honest, I never actually wanted to be a model. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a career that I kind of just fell into. Um, it was a hobby at first, actually. Um, funny enough, I was talking to... Um, an agency the other day and they were like, so what were you doing before you were modeling? And I was like, um, working at a call center, <laughs> uh, working retail. I, don't, I was in school, you know what I mean? So um, it, it was something where someone asked if they could take a few pictures of me, do an interview, and I said, okay, cool, no problem. I'd love to. Those pictures ended up being amazing. They told me to continue doing it and I was like, sure, as a hobby. Posted these things to social media and I was discovered, you know, so that's kind of just... And what, what sort of impact do you think, or what's your thinking about the sort of changing face of how we look and, um, and, you know, how we can be in the world? Because certainly, you know, one of the conversations that I feel I have to have with young people is that, you know, you're more than... I mean, it's very important the way we look. We can't deny that. It would be a bit silly to say, well, don't, you know, it's not about that. It is about that to some extent, but, you know, the conversations I'm having are, you know, there's much more to you than just how you look. But I wonder in such a visual world, you know, what are the wonder sorts of, it, in such a visual world right? that you're working in, you know, what are the conversations about difference and people being able to look different and that being okay? Um, I mean, I think it's kind of new, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it's quite a discussion yet or it's history being made. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably something that will be spoken about 
in the future, but it's something that is new, you know? It's something that is still new for me. People think that, you know, my career going so well as it is, I don't have challenges still. There's still tons of challenges that I go through. Um, I actually do this thing with my fans called Ask Winnie, where I'll have them, you know, write a bunch of questions, and one of them was, um, what are some challenges that you still go through in life? And I was like, well, I mean, my career still. <laughs> you know, there's still companies who don't see me as a model, some companies who um, see me as that girl with the skin condition, just like when I was in school, you know what I mean? So I still have those challenges and those battles today. Can I speak to yeah. that for a second? I, this is my fangirl moment for Chantal, but <laughs> when she was on America's Next Top Model, there was this moment that to me is a very kind of social media moment where the, the well-meaning photographer in the show kept referring uh, to her as his sweet panda bear. And I remember there was a moment where you turned and said, please, don't, don't do that to me. Don't call me an animal, it's not okay. And the way that the script was edited within the show was uh, sort of admonishing you for being disrespectful to the photographer, and I thought, this is a feminist issue, this is a disability rights issue, this is, this is what you're supposed to do. And mind you, my problem wasn't even him calling me that, because I know there's going to be girls out there with my skin condition who are happy to give themselves the nickname, mm -hmm of zebra or happy to give themselves. My problem is not with that at all whatsoever. It's the fact that as if I say I don't like it, you need to respect that. And to me, that's a very social media moment yeah. because you get to intersect in that narrative in a way that's very difficult to do if you're you know, on television, certainly even reality television. The, the narrative is written, it's played out for you. And I think that there's something very powerful and important to that, to be able to say, no, 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 no. This is your image, but this is my story. And it's even more hurtful because I feel like even if that, that word in particular didn't hurt me, mm -hmm. there's going to be a kid out there who's going to see someone in that profession and in that light and say, you know what, he can call her panda, I can go to the girl with vitiligo in my school and I can call her cow if I want to. Mm -hmm. That's how I saw it. You know, even if it didn't hurt me, there's someone who it's going to end up hurting. Nina, that sort of brings me on to thinking about your relationship with your fans. And, you know, I understand that they write you letters, um, ask you for advice. And you're somebody who yourself has had criticism about being a bit slim. You know, what, how do you go about responding to the letters that you get? Um... I get so many letters, like if I'm on tour, people will bring these letters and it's not, most of the time, 90% of them are not, oh my God, I love your music, I'm such a big fan. It's something like, I don't want to like go into personal stories, but it's, it's like, oh, I've got an eating disorder or something like a lot darker that you weren't expecting to read. And for me, it's like, it's like quite touching that they would come to me and talk about it and I feel like if I can help anyone in any way, not that I have the experience to help, but if, even if I can talk to them and hopefully talk them through it or make them feel a bit better about themselves, then I'm like honoured to do that, obviously. Um, but it just surprises me how many girls actually, beneath the surface of their Twitters or their Instagram where they're posting smiling pictures with their friends or pictures of gigs they've gone to, there's a lot, like a darker side to it, definitely. And it's quite shocking when you get to find out how many are out there. I wonder if that, you know, this testimony is you projecting an image which is multi-layered, you know, that actually you're somebody through your songs, through what they see online, you know, is giving them permission to be worried about these things or to ask questions about it because I think you're right there's something about the way in which one can project oneself which doesn't necessarily talk to the layers you know to the slight you know um, uncertainties that lie beneath the surface so mm -hmm. I'm you know I'm sure that's why they are writing yeah no definitely and I think a lot of them come to me because they see me smiling at gigs or they see the pictures that I'm posting and think I'm having a great time all the time and it's like again it's this not fake, but it's this good version of myself that I've put out online. And it's not always great. Obviously, like, everyone has ups and downs. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just it's good to kind of 
put that real self out there and show people that it's not always amazing and there is challenges with everything. Terry, I wonder if you can just sort of help us think about the, the, the good aspects of the internet, mm -hmm. you know, because I think we can get very bogged down in the dilemmas um, mm -hmm. that it presents. But, you know, have you got a sense from what you're reading, what you're studying about, you know, actually, this is a good thing and, you know, we can sort of steer our young people in that direction? Uh, you know, I'm listening to this story and I'm thinking what makes it work with you and your fans is that you're an artist first. You're a conventionally beautiful girl, clearly, but you're first and foremost a singer and an artist, and they connect to that, and they trust that. Uh, we were talking earlier about, uh, I have a, a my 12-year-old my niece, who I love very much, um, I've kind of wound up in this ersatz caretaker position with because her mother died of cancer two years ago, and uh, it's been difficult for her to talk face to face with students in her classes because that kind of thing makes students very, very nervous kids. Uh, but she has a, a pretty involved online presence and by her own admission, she's the chubby girl and um, she sort of identifies as uh, plain and smart. But she's also this fantastic visual artist. So she got online on an, uh, a visual arts community and she takes selfies, but they're usually of her costumes that she designs and things like that. And um, she began getting these friends through those, uh, through those mechanisms and we watch when she gets on Skype with, with them. Uh, and she has this thing, I was almost gonna keep it on my phone. She has this, these seven sticky notes from her friends that she keeps on her wall in front of her computer and they say, I'm really sad when you're not online or you're the best listener I know or I think you're magic. And she tells me that's her mirror and she looks at that before she goes and does her work. For me, that's, there's something really powerful about that. Mm. Yeah, but also, you know, one would hope and I would believe that those around her are allowing her to be able to take up that Absolutely. space. Absolutely. And we don't say, you know, we got to go, feel free to talk to the child predator online. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. there's a negotiation, and, and there's, but there's also trust, first and foremost, that, that there's a space called school, and then there's a space called online life, and then there's a space called home life, and our job is to be there as a sounding board in between those spaces, and to not discredit where she feels the most comfortable, but our job is to make ourselves the most comfortable with where she feels the most comfortable. I think that's terribly important. I mean, I think that you know, one of the encounters that I have with young people is that there only seems to be one space, mm. and that's the online space, and at the cost of being involved in anything else. And so parents have really got to get much closer in order to really help children move between all of the different spaces, because, you know, online is very, very one-dimensional in lots of ways. Winnie, I just wondered if you had any sort of tips from your own experience that you would be giving to young women about, you know, their, their sort of relationship with themselves. Um, well, speaking of relationships with yourself, my favorite advice I've ever given is to focus on your opinion of yourself mm -hmm. rather than the opinions of others. Um, for me, that helped me a lot in my life. That was kind of like the, the uh, everybody always asks me, like, when was the turning point? When did you become confident? I'm like, there was really no turning point. It was just me making the conscious decision slowly but surely to focus on my own opinion of myself rather than the opinions of others and realize that, wait, why am I saying I'm ugly? I actually don't think I'm ugly. I think I'm beautiful. Where did I get this idea from that I wasn't beautiful from someone else, mm -hmm. not from myself. Mm -hmm. So to listen to your own heart, you know, as cliche as it, as it is, your heart will lead you through, you know? Yeah. Susie, I, I was sort of wondering about what uh, Winnie's just said, because, you know, to, in order to get that relationship with yourself, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of help and a bit of scaffolding around that. And, you know, one of the things that I've been reading about recently is that a primary school in the UK has been talking to very young children about the images that they're encountering, that actually there's a lot of photoshopping that goes on, there's a lot of synthesis. You know, what, what's your thought about that? Is, is that helpful? 
I think anything that happens at school is helpful as long as the teachers, the dinner ladies, everybody who interacts with the five-year-olds has actually gone through a process of understanding their own relationship to their body, to beauty and what they project and to food. And because otherwise, they're just delivering a lesson that doesn't work, that doesn't speak into their own conflicts, their own difficulties. And of course, most of us are still mother-reared. And so the, most, the key person that I would want to speak to and, and the key person that all sorts of programs are speaking to is catching mums very early on in the process, when they're thinking of becoming mums, when they're, when they're reproducing, to remember that they are the most important influence in a girl's life. They're also the most important in a boy's, but in a different kind of way. And that everything they do represents the possibilities for that girl, what the, what the world can be and what it can't be. And every time a mother looks in the mirror and sighs and says, ugh, <laughs> that girl grows up thinking, I see, that's what it means to be a grown up woman, is to go, ugh. That is the relationship that I'm to have to my body. Every time a woman says, I shouldn't eat that, that girl is picking up the idea that there's good foods and bad foods rather than that appetite and relish are important. So this is not to put more heavy stuff on mums because every mum wants to do it right, but it's to see that mums could make a contribution that is so positive that would be an antiviral agent against the horror that's coming in and then you would have those five-year-olds with those kind of, come from those families thinking, yeah, my mum showed me this, this, that, and the other, and this is how you do it. But, it, but there's two different kinds of worlds. And okay. Thank you. I mean, I think, you know, my take on it is that this is everybody's business. And whilst, you know, you're putting parents at the fore of that, I think we've all got to pay attention to this game changer, which is called social media and the internet, and wrap ourselves around young people so they can feel body confident and confident in lots of other ways. So thank you very much.